very moody. I came up here a few days ago to get you some perspective on the village from the mountains. Now we're barely in the foothills here, but I was really happy to find this. Not that I didn't know it was here. This was really badly rippled, kind of poured concrete, and it runs, it, it goes back to that and runs all the way up the mountain from here. But it's been paved because it's an access road to a quarry. Now it does mean there's some gravel all over it, which is a bit of a bummer, but it's not a particularly fast section. And these two, this pair of switchbacks here, they're barely, 200 meters from the van. I mean, it's just over the mountain. So I'm looking forward to having something a bit more cornery than the Jeep to give it a go on. The Jeep, I kind of put through its paces a little bit while I was up here the other night. It's not mine, so I didn't go particularly hard on it, but it's not too bad, it's capable. Um, if a little lacking in wheel travel, suspension travel, it's more of a road car anyway. Now, before I left Ireland, I had my first track day and it was an eye-opener for a number of reasons. And we're gonna to talk to a guy who runs a track day in Ireland a little bit later. But first, it is time to get into some work on the van. So here it is. You're going to notice some shaking throughout this section. Do not adjust your set. The shake is down to the rocking of the van. And you know what they say about when the vans are rocking? Well, it ain't that. Now, the first thing we're gonna do is tackle the steering box. And I couldn't avoid having the spanner in the shot in this one. And once I'd released that, the bolt on the spline of the steering column and the screws holding the bottom of the column inside the cab, I was able to turn my attention to getting the steering box out. Now I thought I was gonna to have to get the arm off the steering box to get it through the chassis, but no, it comes through without doing that. And once on the floor, I put everything back where I had found it for safekeeping. Back on the car, the next thing was the clutch arm that links to the clutch pedal. That came out with just three bolts, I think, and out it came, no problem. And then down to the handbrake lever. And the little shaft that holds this in is known for seizing. This one was no different. I tried to pry it out of the bracket, but that was just silly. So I turned my attention to the accelerator cable, took that off the little pivot plate it sits on, and then took the arm that comes from the pedal itself to the pivot plate off. But the pedal is still bolted inside the car. Next thing was the brake pedal, that came off no problem. And there was a relay on some wiring under here I would save for the aftermarket spotlights. I released that off the chassis and pulled the wiring back through into the cab. So now we're starting to look a bit more bare here and I decided to start cleaning the bottom of the car to assess what kind of a nick it's in. And aside from it having some under seal there, which is great news, I noticed this plate. Now the problem with this plate is, although it's been well done, it was done over the hole in the floor rather than in it. So it's a rust trap. There's two layers of steel here and there's rust forming in between them. I couldn't get a camera angle to show you that, but take my word for it, you can kind of see the two layers on the edges here. This, I'm gonna have to cut out some more. And you can see the welding, the edges of the plate just along here. So that all has to come out. All in all though, the bottom of this car is in great nick, which is good news. So now you'll see, now you see the rust that was forming in between those panels and out comes all the excess material. I got some CAD work going and I made a very simple plate to fit inside this hole rather than on it. And the welds aren't bad at all. I've missed a little bit there, but we can go back and that. Okay, inside the cab, this is already released, but this arm you see here locates the steering column kind of fore to aft. It's just one bolt on the front panel of the car, inside the front panel. You'll see it here. Here it is, very simple. 
And then I released the speedo drive off the back of the speedometer. This is just the same as most. You could just unscrew this very, very easy. I suspended the steering wheel from the A pillar just as a precaution. I didn't want it to fall and break some switch gear or something like that. The least parts I have to find for this thing, the better. Okay, going back through this, I feel a bit scatty. I didn't get all of the footage I would have normally have gotten. I didn't take footage of the steering wheel coming off. And there's this cartridge underneath the steering wheel in the steering column that houses all of the controls on the column. It's held in by these long screws you see I have backed out here. And here it is hanging down. It's, a, like I say, a big long kind of a cartridge that runs inside the steering column. You'll see it in a second. But I took that out and then I was able to pull out the steering column itself. Now here it is going back in. Very clever, very simple. Put all this stuff again back together for safekeeping and off that goes. I tried to start it just for the crack, but no, we, I don't think we've got a spark for some reason. Okay, let's try and get the wiring out of the cab. Now the one place there was a snag literally was the headlamp bowls. The loom that runs in for the headlights is hardwired in here. So I had no choice but to cut these wires and we'll have to rewire them in the rebuild. So with those off, I could thread the cable back out of the headlamp bolts and pull the wiring loom out. Now there's one thing left here and that is the main loom running under the floor. Somewhere along the way, something happened to this van because every wire on that loom, the main section of the loom has been cut and repaired with what looks like hi-fi cable this kind of joined brown cable. So some judicious snipping. And that can be pulled through to the cab and out comes the wiring loom. Now before we leave the van for this section, this is what is known, I believe, as an M plate, and it's like the plate you find on Mercedes cars that specifies the car. And the interesting thing on this plate, I'm not gonna decode the whole thing, is that this van was originally ordered for the Deutsche Bundespost. It was a post van, yellow, and it had a black bugle on the side, I've said this before, and lettering reading Deutsche Bundespost. You know, I'm not really into a big yellow van, so I'm not going to restore this back to post van but maybe we'll make some kind of a creative tip of the hat to that history of it somewhere on the van before we're done now we've no sheet metal break in this episode because i'm not in ireland to be able to work on it but we're going to go into the vogue before we do so many people tried to guess and see what the brass fittings were it was gotten by somebody i should have barred because he's an unfair advantage our kind of resident vintage hot rod dude mark wellnitz got it they are brass Ford Model T radiator caps. Now, I'm not sure that they're original factory ones or the original style. These are called dog bones, minor reproductions for sure. The, the hole in the middle was for your little kind of hood ornament temperature gauge. Anyway, so many people guessed and the, the, the guesses were close. We were kind of, the theme was all there. It was either, you know, vintage fire hydrants or fire extinguishers or hose fittings. But anyway, that's what they are. Dog bone radiator caps from a Ford Model T. Okay, we're gonna go and look at the Vogue. There is some work to be done there, and here it is. And I've stood in a wild patch of oregano, or oregano, depending on where you're sniffing it. Wow, it feels like an age since I've seen the Vogue. And I'm actually looking forward to getting back to work on it. We had to sacrifice it last time for the sake of the interview. While I was cleaning the chassis, I was trying to get all of the under seal off, which was very resilient. I'd love to know what brand it was and generally making it ready for a new coat of paint and more under seal. Now over to the anti-roll bar, you know, this bolt looked really bad, but the great thing about Land Rovers is the bolts tend to be very big and robust and respond well to a good wire brushing. And all of these did. These are the small bolts for the anti-roll bar mounts. Over to the diff. And I had never noticed this until a friend from Argentina who builds off-roaders crazy machines, which I'll show you another time, came in and the first thing he did was reach under and say, hey, what's this? <laughs> it's like a child was given a kind of a spatula and some black icing and told to ice the cake. And this little sunroof was left in the top just to ensure that water could go in the back and trap itself in there, rusting things away. 
I'm not sure I want to even attempt to pull this stuff off. What horrors lie beneath? But anyway, the first thing to do is to establish that I can actually get the fill and drain plugs open on this diff because if I can't, then there's not much point in doing anything, is there? The fill plug opened no problem. The drain plug I had been told by my uncle had been a real pain and he couldn't get it open the last time he tried. And it did take a hell of a lot of work. So that's the first win, but I need to pluck up some courage to get into this whole thing. So over to the anti-roll bar joints and I released the castellated nuts off these. The split pins were toast. And off those came. And I went and undid all the rest of the bolts and took the anti-roll bar out. Now I decided it was time to drain this diff oil. And I have never seen oil come out of a Land Rover diff as perfect as this. Usually these breathers you have on the axles get compromised somehow or the car is weighted too deeply or whatever and water gets into the axle, into the diff and the oil gets kind of mayonnaised. This oil though, I mean, spotless. I could not get over how clean it was. I wish I had a known because then I would have put down a clean container and reused it because this has clearly got life left in it. Anyway, time to peel off this icing. And there had been a hole obviously corroded through this diff housing and it's been fixed with some kind of chemical weld and then for double measure, the icing put over the top, which is just fair enough, but you could have tried to seal it at the top as well. I'm using a really aggressive wire wheel on the grinder for all of this, by the way. Now, this poses a very difficult question to answer. Do I open this up completely or do I peel this back to where it's still solid and then paint over it with something decent and some under seal? Because to do this with a welder is to open the diff. I'd have to take the diff out of this, which means opening the ends of the drive shaft as well and breaking a lot of seals. It's not rocket science, it's very easy, but it's just a hell of a lot more work. I'm gonna mull it over and while I do, Let's get on with some other stuff. I had tried to get the back box off this before. I, I, I kind of gave up, but I went at it again. No problem this time. I kind of prized up the two flanges on the end of the back box section and with some lubrication and a lot of moving, this thing came off. And the reason I did this was to get at the chassis leg on this side easier. I could only get so far behind it with the back box on. So I cleaned the chassis and then I turned my attention to the brakes because I'm going to have to take the brake lines off this axle to do a proper job of cleaning it up. Up on top of the axle there's a kind of a brake junction point. I don't know what you'd call it actually but off that came and I hung the brake lines up which kind of reminds me in a macabre way of a scene from the Silence of the Lambs. Okay with those out I could take the calipers off no problem there and the brake shields were a little bit trickier to get off, but they came off no problem too. I jacked the car up to get the wheel off on the near side to get at that caliper. And off that one came and a heat shield too. Next was the dampers and the springs. Now I was hoping to just drop the axle far enough down that the springs would come out. But of course the Land Rover is designed so that the springs don't fall out. So with a set of spring compressors at the ready, I pulled out the offside spring first and then went for the near side one. These things are so dangerous. Depending on the springs, Mercedes springs tend to be very dangerous. You need the right spring compressor for the right job. So just be careful with that kind of stuff. The near side one came out no problem. I'm using the axle to compress it and a jack and then I don't have to do so much work with the spring compressors. The last thing was the prop shaft. I had a bit of a weird problem with this prop shaft. It didn't, I, the car was in neutral, the transfer box was in neutral and yet this prop shaft didn't want to spin freely. And I kind of forced it. I really hope I haven't done any damage but we'll find out about that again. Both of the axle ends were free so it wasn't anything to do with the differential. This axle is coming out of the car, I've decided. 
Okay, this is the ball joint on the A-frame. It's the second last thing holding this axle on the car. I put some foam underneath it just in case it drops to the floor too hard. I release the castellated nut off the ball joint in the center and the last thing holding this on are the two trailing arms coming off the chassis on the fore end of the axle. I'd forgotten to take off the offside damper. Both dampers came out and here are the trailing arms. Like I said, big robust engineering. Even with rust, this stuff always comes free, which I really love. And I was able to slide the axle out from underneath the car. And next time we'll get into cleaning that up. At this point I hear you ask, why not just do a full restoration? Well, look, I want this car out. I really want to get the Esprit moving again. And one way or the other, this car is going to be around. So I'm going to get it to as high a standard as I can without doing a full resto. And then the rest of the work I will consider a rolling concern. Now, a big shout out to John Taylor, who sent me these really tantalizing photos of himself and his Caterham 7 in the Pyrenees, the Spanish side. He says this is a section, or these are sections of the N260 on the Spanish side of the Pyrenees. Uh, I've spent time on the French side, both ends and in the middle, but I don't know this road. It looks right up my alley, that kind of flowing, kind of faster section, twisty, rather than switchback after switchback. Anyway, John, thanks a million for the photographs. The next person, or people, are Harry and Ollie Proctor. You remember these guys? They have, between them, um, Land Rovers and a Triumph Spitfire and this little singer, this little naughty car. And I just thought this clip that they sent me is an example, sets an example of how to just have some crack with your cars and have fun with them and not be too precious. I think this is really just crisis. So gents, keep it up. Um, yeah, looks like a lot of fun. And uh, thanks a million for the, for the clip. Okay, the person I want to send the kit to, the Valley Pro kit, is John Nicholson. And John is in the Balearic Islands and he has a 65 midget, a Mark II midget, 1098cc. He is undergoing a restoration of that one and he's also got a 74 BMW 1802 which is kitted out for regularity rallies which is something I think he's just really getting into but he says this thing needs quite a bit of work and he's a, a sucker for projects that no one else wants that are full of rust. You sound like me. Uh, the kit is on its way to you and we'll be there for you I hope when the MG is finished mate. He, he said to me, you know, I hope these photos of the MG kind of with the body sprayed and everything are comforting to you. Well, <laughs> they're jealousy making. Gives me an attack of the green-eyed monster. So uh, thanks anyway, and look, have fun with them. I hope you get them finished soon, mate. Now, my Track Days experience. I went with a company called trackdays.ie, and we're going to meet a fella called Rob who runs it. But I just want to say that I've always been the kind of figure it out quietly by myself kind of guy you know and what happened was a light was really shone on uh, <laughs> what I thought my driving would be and what it really is and that sparked something it sparked maybe the want or maybe the excuse just to get another car but it's, it sparked the want to kind of maybe build something and go and quietly try and figure out the whole thing by myself um, with you in tow of course there's no room logistically, financially, physically for a track car at the moment or a track car build, but maybe that's something, it is something I want to bring in. Maybe the Jag could become that car. Jags have been put Mark IIs to very good use um, on track in the past. I'm going to look at that. I've seen something else though, mid-engined and Italian. We'll see what happens. Anyway, here is the little chat with Rob and I think there's some really interesting stuff in this. Rob King is my name, and um, myself and Stephen Kershaw, we run TrackDays.e, um, which is, uh, is, well, it's a track days company. So basically, you uh, we hire uh, the racetrack from Mondale Park or Kirkstown or whoever it may be, and then we sell out the spaces to people who want to come and drive their car on the racetrack. That's it. So we started in November last year. So this is our, we've done one full year. So and this is our first event of 2018. I suppose. So well, well, I've been kind of racing bits and pieces off and on since I was eight. Like so, I started karting when I was eight. Did a bit of hill climbing and stuff in the UK with my dad. Um, and then when I moved to Ireland, I did a little bit of sprint and hill climbs as well. But and then probably did a, a few 
track days kind of back around 2010, 2011, that kind of that kind of time, they were really popular. Then it all kind of died down with the recession kind of thing quite a lot. Um, and then just last year, we kind of saw that there was a bit of a gap in the market. There was only really one other company doing it, and um, guys called Octane, they do a very good job. Um, but they're all kind of, it's more like a club through a forum kind of thing. And we, we felt there was an opportunity for a more kind of open uh, track day format. And um, yeah, we just took the plunge and, and went for it. But that, the, the, that's the right word, experience. So before I think a track day was you, you paid your money, you went out on track and, and, and that was pretty much it. What we're hoping to do is to turn it into a bit more of an experience. So you, you pay your money, there's tuition available, there's product available that you need like oils and fluids and uh, racing brake fluid. There's professional tuition on hand. We've got race drivers here who are driving LMP2 cars and stuff like that. So um, we have virtual reality simulators at a lot of the events. Um, we're hoping to have kind of welding dis uh, you know, displays and things like this coming forward. So just something that you might actually bring your family to eventually, uh, not just you and your buddies kind of uh, blasting around all day. So yeah, just trying to make it more, more of an experience as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. No, we, we don't get in, around everybody. We get a lot of people here, so um, we get around as many as we can and, and not everybody wants any uh, help or tuition, but the, the more we can give people some pointers, the, the higher the, the standard of driving on track, which obviously reflects well on us as a company and, and makes the day better as a whole. Uh, well, there's two ways we do it. So people, the, the vast majority of people bring their own car. So that's that's the, the, the historic way, uh, typical way that a track day works. You, you bring your own car, drive around all day, go home with it, either on a trailer or drive it on the road. We have our own cars that we hire out. So we've got a fleet of uh, EK Civics. Uh, we've just bought a clear 172 as well. Um, and we hire them out either with an instructor or if you've got a bit of track experience, you can hire it on, on its own kind of thing. So for a, a bit less money. Um, and that's actually proven really popular so it's uh, it's kind of a, a thing that you can you could buy somebody as a present it's, it was really popular at Christmas and uh, there's nobody else really doing it so now Mon Mondello Park do their own driving experiences and the BMWs and whatnot but um, with this you just get a lot of seat time which is great so you can be in the car for either a half day or a whole day um, literally behind the wheel for nearly all that time so uh, for not a huge amount of money. The um, 4x4 Jeep kind of things and, and MPVs, you know, people carriers, um, wouldn't be ideal. Like, um, but pretty much anything else goes. Um, we've had guys here in Volvo S40 diesels, and we, there's a load of Fiestas here, like just 1.25 ZTEX, not even the race cars. Um, but then we get guys in Nissan GTRs and Porsches and Ferraris, and, and we get a load of race cars. So, yeah, it really is anything goes. Once it's kind of mechanically sound and the panels aren't hanging off it and the thing looks presentable, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I'm not staring at you, no. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the with that cartoon. The things that kind of generally go wrong uh, most quickly on a on a track car uh, are where heat's involved. So the brakes and the cooling system are the, are the main things, and the tyres. So. Um, what most people think uh, when brakes overheat so they get brake fade or whatever the pedal goes to the floor they think that it's the pads of the discs nine times out of ten, well I'd say eight times out of ten it's actually the brake fluid because brake fluid absorbs water over time and uh, probably on most cars that be here it hasn't been changed in years and years and years so change the brake fluid put some decent racing brake fluid in it standard set of, of, of road pads um, or if you've got something really powerful or heavy then you know, upgrade the pads to EBC or something like that and put, a, you know, a decent standard set of discs on. So that's one thing. Um, make sure the cooling system's all working, fully topped up. Put coolant in it because that can lower the temperatures as well. Um, and then road tyres. So your, your standard road tyres will generally kind of overheat after three or four laps kind of thing. So if you put something like Yoko AO48 or or that kind of thing, you know, a semi-slick tyre, um, you'll get a lot more running before they kind of fall off that cliff. So that makes a, a huge difference. Higher boiling point. So that's basically it. Um, like standard, I don't know, I kind of think what it boils at now, but it's just standard dot for brake fluid, but uh, racing brake fluid, it just has a higher boiling point and it absorbs less water, basically. Is there a downside to putting that 
Yeah. No, not whatsoever. Absolutely not. No. no. It's not even that expensive as well. Like I think it's, I think it's less than twenty quid for five hundred mils or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's not. We've got a dyno day on actually at Stone Motorsport. I don't. Do you, did you ever go to that facility? It's amazing. You should go there. Um, yeah, those buggies are bad. Like, um, basically, a dyno day is where you, uh, a bunch of guys or girls, bring their car along to the the rolling road, um, and you just do a power run basically. So they strap it down to the dyno. Uh, the the guy who looks after the dyno, Joe Power, which is a great name for a guy running a dyno, um, looks after it. And, and there's 20 of you there or whatever. And at the end of the day, you put all the power runs on the on the board and. Um, prizes for the best presented all that kind of stuff it's just a bit of crack um, and then the other thing we're going to be doing is um, a road run which we haven't actually figured out the, the what it's exactly going to be yet but it's basically going to be a road a one day road trip from point A to point B with some nice lunch at point B and then but there's going to be a competitive kind of element in the middle like a treasure hunt or something like that so just to kind of add a bit of something extra to it so um, I think that's probably going to be aimed more at the kind of classic car guys than, than perhaps the, some of these guys here but um, I'd say a lot of these guys have other cars as well that might be interesting so yeah that's 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 what we're at for this year. Bizarrely you don't need anything other than a helmet um, to do a track day um, which is a little bit odd seeing as you know you're on a racetrack almost going at racing speeds but um, yeah um, just a just a standard helmet open or closed face um, we do st um, we've started kind of stocking gloves and things as well, but um, yeah, nobody really wears them. But uh, yeah, it's a good idea to keep your arms covered, um, just in case you do kind of have an, an accident and there's glass anywhere. But uh, yeah, that's it. Um, there's a there's a endurance series in the pipeline that I'm hopefully going to be running this year as well, which I might even take part in. So uh, um, you never know; that might be what scratches the itch. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, it's um, the there's, there's the the Seat Super Cup uh, Championship. Um, it's been running for the last few years, and they kind of struggle for numbers a little bit, and are getting amalgamated with other classes. So, the guys, uh, the guy who was running it, um, just basically doesn't have time, and the the, the team approached me and see asked to see what I run it, and um, kind of was on an iron, but uh, and it was kind of hard to figure out how you'd promote it. But we kind of got together and said well look if we did this and changed the format a bit and, and opened the rules up and made it available to a bunch of other cars um, and made the races now along with a with a, a pit stop and a driver change then I'm interested so that's what we're going to do. Pretty much anything so there'll be a time a lower time barrier so if your car can't get round a lap of the international track here in 107 or whatever it is then it's not quick enough because the the main bulk of the cars that are taking part can get round in under a minute. So you need to have some kind of rules around, you know. Otherwise, there'd just be mobile chicanes on the track. So um, especially with an hour-long race. So yeah, pretty much that. And once the, the car obviously has to meet the motorsport kind of island regs with safety and harnesses and cages and all that kind of stuff. So once it does that. Um, and it's a closed wheel car, like a, it can be a can be a sports car, a saloon car, or a, uh, you know, something like a radical, or whatever. Uh, yeah, away you go. Yeah, we, we, that, we that's been in discussion, but um, and that's tricky to sort out. Um, for the start, at the start, we just we're just gonna have to suck it and see uh, and see what turns up because that's very difficult to enforce. Um, but yes, there may well have to be something. Yeah. The driving like an idiot is is when you start ending up in the gravel and and being sideways everywhere and, and getting in people's way and not moving out of people's way and, and things like this. So, um, you know, track days are all about kind of mutual respect with each other and, and keeping an eye on the mirrors and it's always going to be somebody faster than you. So, uh, if you've got a car behind you for more than a corner or two, you just need to get out of the way. And if you're in something really quick, then on a track day, you, you the kind of the trade off for all that seat time. And, and value for money is the fact that you you have to accept that you're going to get held up for a little bit. So once you take all that on board and uh, just get out there, get on with it, then it tends to run very very smoothly. 
and overall it's a very very friendly kind of experience and and if you have a problem as you might and, and often is the case that you'll probably have a swarm of people around the car trying to help you out which is fantastic I love to see it um, there's never never really any aggro and and if somebody is you know driving like a bit of a fool then they tend to come and say to us we go and have a word with them and um, and they take it on the chin and behave themselves so yeah it's it's good it's great it's a really good atmosphere it's, there's no pressure like on a race day nobody's here setting time so it's just good fun you know hanging out with a bunch of guys who are into cars and uh, talking shy basically I had a deadly day on track, really did. And if nothing else, Tina's story has been added to, which I think is something very cool. Something's definitely been awoken. I had worked up in my head in the late 90s a spec for a circuit racing mini. And whether it's that or the Mark II Jag or this little Italian number that I have a growing lust for, I'm not sure. But it's while on the back burner, I am thinking about it actively. So we'll see what happens. Okay, my patrons. Berlin Heck, Caleb Schneider, Douglas Reed, Nick Broadus, um, Oscar Judd, Richard Warren, Simon Gardner, Stuart McNaughton, and Dan Brinks and Peter Magnus are, are existing pledges that up their, their stakes. Um, gents, you probably know from seeing the patron updates on the page, I'm doing this for the love of it and, you know, the passion. But as something I have an aspiration would become a living for me, and it is my living. You guys and Valet Pro pay my income. Now, it's not a living yet, but the fact that you're there makes that a possibility. There is, you know, the potential for that down the line if it can keep growing the way it's growing. So all I can do is say a very heartfelt thanks. Okay, this is a little hot on the heels of my heartfelt thanks. Thank you, patrons. I forgot something though, this guy. Here is a man just getting it done. I did say hello to him, but he was on his way out and I didn't want to disturb him. But here's a guy just getting it done. And if you look, this car is strapped through the cabin. And you know, why not? It's a track car and it's a solid one at that. Unconfirmed eyewitness reports say that when he was taking it down in the morning, it dropped from about four feet, which just reminds me of the old Volkswagen ad. Do you remember this? This car, Volkswagen Golf, very tough as old boot. Very reliable. Volkswagen Golf, best selling number one imported car in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, real or not, I'd love to see them get that accent into an ad these days. Okay, that's it for episode 20. I will be back ASAP and I will endeavour to keep it as interesting and as cool as possible. Until then, stay stuck in and good luck.